All right, guys. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started since we don't really have a uh, we don't really have a program today because of the thing at one o'clock. I didn't want to keep you guys on the internet all day. Um, so what I want to talk to you guys about today is whatever you guys wanted to talk about. So I did get an email and I had a situation just arise this morning um, that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, if you guys aren't doing uh, Op City, then you should be. If you're not doing home. Uh, the homes.com, which is Prime Street, then you should be. Um, Malvis, I know you've been getting a lot of Prime Street stuff lately. I get copied when you guys get stuff. Um, so you guys got to do those things. So I had somebody today, though, one of our agents who's not on this call, and she was working with a um, an op city lead, and she put in an offer, and they were trying to negotiate the offer, and her client said, well, tell them I've got another offer in on another property and, you know, I need to have an answer back. And she said, you do have another offer, offer in on another property? She'd already asked him if he was working with somebody and he had said no. And he said, yes. And she said, so you're working with another agent? And he said, well, yeah, but I didn't sign anything with them. So guys, um, and, she's, and she's worried about, like you guys do sometimes, you, you worry. And she's worried, am I violating ethics by working with this guy if he's working with another realtor, even though he didn't sign anything? No. So, uh, no. But guys, if you get somebody, look, I tell you about the buyer brokerage agreement, and I know you guys don't want to do it, but that is a great opportunity to educate your client. Why does she need to work? Why does this client need to work with, with Daryl or Edul if they're already working with Mike? Well, if Mike lets them know that he can show them any house that anyone else can show them. I'm a, I'm a member of the local board of realtors, the National Association of Realtors, the Florida Association of Realtors. I have access to the, to the MLS. I can show you any house that Daryl could show you or Edul could show you, right? I can, I can represent you on anything. They don't understand that. They think, how many times do they think that the only person they can work with is a listing agent, right? Oh, that's their house to sell. They don't understand. They don't understand that they don't pay for it. They think they're saving money. How many people think they're saving money by going directly to the buyer, to the listing agent? All of them, right? So yeah, why not, why not cut out the middleman? Um, because you don't understand what's going on. That's why, right? So you've got to educate them. Guys, if you go in for, for surgery on your Achilles tendon tomorrow, how many of you would know what to do? The difference between a realtor and a doctor is that a, doc, a, a realtor doesn't think they're a doctor right? Everybody thinks they're a realtor, but a realtor doesn't think they're a doctor. That's the difference. So you guys are professionals. You guys are the experts. You've got to educate the people and walking them through a buyer brokerage agreement is a great way to educate them without making them feel dumb. Look, my broker makes me do this. So I've got to walk you through it by law. I've got to walk you through these documents before you sign them. Okay. And that's a great way to educate people. Take the time guys. Look, you get a check for, for five, 10, 15, 20 grand. Don't you, don't you think it's worth the time to walk somebody through a few minutes of a document? And some of you guys are so nervous about feeling like you're not worthy of, of making money or you're not, uh, you don't have value as a professional. Let people know you have value as a professional. What do you think people think of realtors? Think they think of them very highly? Most of the time they don't, right? You're a means to an end. You've got access to MLS. That's all they think they need you for, by the way. You've got access to MLS. That's all they think they need. But what they really, they need you for all the other things that you do. Guys, you might not even know that you're competent, but do you ever hear, ever have to explain something to a friend of yours over a beer and they're asking you what you had to do on this deal and you tell them all the things that you do? And uh, you ever explain people what you do and you think after a while, you think, wow, I really do kind of know what I'm doing. You learn, you just absorb stuff, even if you're not actively learning, but you guys come in here and absorb stuff from all of the other agents on here every week right? You can absorb stuff just from being around and from doing it. These, these buyers and sellers, they're doing five to 10 transactions in their lives. And um, most of them, they're just signing documents and, and they understand a little bit about what's going on, but they don't know the ins and outs of this stuff. They don't know how to close out permits and you know do all the stuff that you guys do, what to do when you have to withhold escrow on a deal and all this other kind of stuff. They don't understand any of that stuff. You are the professionals and you walk them through this stuff and have some third party stories and stuff like that to present. Guys, you're salespeople and you're professionals. So demonstrate that. And I know you think you're too good for the buyer brokerage agreement and this is your best friend and they're going to work with you and blah, blah, blah. They're also, they're also 
if they think that they're going to save ten thousand dollars by going straight to a listing agent they'll give you a, they'll give you a, a a gift card to somewhere and work directly with that with that agent and say oh man uh, Vivian, I'm so sorry for wasting your time, but uh, here's a gift card, right? Have fun at the Cheesecake Factory, right? Because that's what people do. So that's what we do, guys. Be professionals. I had a, um, you guys know when any, every week you guys, for this open forum, you can send me, of course, my computer logged me out of my email, but you can, you can send me questions and stuff, things that you want to go over. Um, we did have um, one agent sent me something that that uh, that they wanted to go over, um, and she's a little shy. She doesn't like to speak up in the meeting, so she sent me an email about it. I won't let you guess who it is. Um, but Malvis wanted to know um, if you, it, when you have a um, special assessment, special assessments. Seller pays uh, and an as-is contract with representing a buyer, line 185, when that is marked, does it mean the seller is paying any assessments that are currently owed slash due to be paid? Yes, so I can't, uh, I guess I could screen share this, you guys, but you guys know it on the contract where it says, um, A or B, seller shall pay the assessment in full prior to the time of closing or buyer shall pay after their, you know, the assessment after closing. Um, if you are writing a contract, I would want these assessments closed out before at closing, right? I have seen as many as three. I'm sure that you guys have stories of more than this or whatever. I'm not trying to tell a fish story here. I've seen as many as three um, special assessments on top of a regular uh, association dues. I have seen uh, one was 287 a month, one was around 150 and one was around 75. And they just kept stacking these on there. Um, and the total of the whole thing was about 16,000. That was all it was due. So they'll put a special assessment on for a set amount of you know, we need two years at 175 from each owner here to pay for this. Um, so that's a special assessment that they do. Yes, you want the, this. I mean, guys, when you own a condo and you get a special assessment, that's money out of your pocket. It is a loss. And if you sell it to someone, you got to figure you got to pay those at closing. So the special assessment is forget about how much it is a month. It's either 15 grand or five grand or whatever it is, right? So you pay those at closing if you're the seller, if the buyer writes their contract correctly. Um, the second part you sent me in the condo writer, are those assessments the ones referred to in the contract? Yeah, the special assessments, right? And so she's got here on uh, uh, number two on the condo writer, special assessments um, levied or pending exist of effective date are disclosed by the above by the seller and may be paid in installments. Check one, buyer or seller shall pay installments due after closing date. Um, as you know, good luck getting a seller to pay anything after a closing date. So it says here in, in bold, if seller is checked, seller shall pay the assessment in full prior to or at the time of closing. Guys, this is what you want to happen if you're on the buy side or the, I mean, it's a lot cleaner all the way around. Um, and make sure this is reflected in the price. Okay. So if, if, you know, this, this is 15 grand, it's, it's cold, hard cash. Either way you look at it, it's 15 grand out of somebody's pocket or five grand or one grand or whatever it is, how much ever it is. Okay. That's money out of somebody's pocket. So if the, um, the, the make sure your seller knows this is X amount of dollars less that you're going to actually walk away from closing. All right. Brian, um, by, put, by checking that box in both the as is contract and the condo writer, seller to pay installments uh, due um, in full or assessments in full prior to closing means that anything that they owe for the so the buyer is basically protected in another word in another right in another right the buyer will just have the regular fee going forward because when they do a special assessment you could you could pay it if you want to in cash or they'll give you an assessment thing typically they give you that option so yes yeah, so the seller has chosen to pay it slowly over time when it comes due, it comes due, just like any other kind of lien or anything on the condo, they have to pay it at closing. If you check so on the, the right buyer side, on the right, buyer side, see, you always wanted to check that box, seller to pay. Yeah, for. you do, but you'll see some people, some sellers will say, oh, we're not paying, we do not want to pay these, these special assessments. The buyer is, it has to take over special. So make sure you reflect that in your offer price. Don't be surprised by that later because that's money out of the buyer's pocket. So the buyer is 
in that case, inherits. What do you mean by by do that by in the offer price? Because if I still owe ten thousand dollars on something, but I tell you, if you want to buy my condo, you're going to have to take over. I'm not paying off these special assessments or going with it. Which ah, is, you which mean is, which add is, that into your listing price? You add that into your offer price. Yes. Okay. Now I'm not talking about from the seller. I'm talking about if you're representing the buyer, take that into consideration when you offer. Don't offer what you actually want to pay. Offer ten thousand yes. less. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan. Quick question. Yes. So please. these assessments, uh, how do you uh, the title company? They they're the ones when they do the search. They tell you exactly what's outstanding, right? Mm -hmm. The estoppel will. Yeah. Yeah. When the estoppel comes in, okay. And because uh, sometimes maybe the seller's not even aware of it. Uh, they they I mean unless it's something that's that's going on and they'll always ask about well as when you're buying a condo you want to ask about pending litigation as well. Um, if you're financing it, the bank will definitely have a questionnaire for the um, for the manager to yeah. fill out, and it'll ask if they have any pending litigation on, as either a plaintiff or a defendant, um, and they will uh, have to disclose that. But um, otherwise, yeah, they'll you'll know any special assessments. Um, sometimes they'll tell you they have an upcoming special assessment, but that is for you as the buyer's agent to find that out on a cash deal, which most condo deals are cash deals. So it's up to you to find that out. Do you guys oh, have- How do you find that out? How do you ask find the it? You ask the manager. Well, the manager, uh, the manager said that those documents are closing documents that have to be um, request and paid for. Yes. Yeah. And they, they usually don't, the title companies don't do that until like way, way, down the transaction when it's almost ready to close. That is true. Okay. So well, even the so stop letter doesn't come in during. So even a stop letter is usually not in until in during the inspection period. Stop letters are not sometimes even ordered until. Okay, but on but on their on their uh, disclosure, they said whether or not they had pending litigation. The seller said that. So if the seller violated that, then you can get out of the deal. If the seller did not inform you of the pending litigation, even if they didn't know about it, then you can get out of the deal when you find out about it. Okay, that's the point of the condo writer to disclose all Keep that. Keep in mind, if you're buying a condo, you legally have a guaranteed three days to review all of the HOA documents, state law. So you can't waive that, you have three days. So if they don't even send you every document that's on that list, then that clock doesn't even start until you get every document. Right, but a lot of the times they those HOA documents, they will say, well, you have to order them. Here's a yes. link, here's a website. Oh, uh, state, no, state law requires the seller to provide them. Uh, I, I usually, most my experience, most of the time, they always direct you to a website and there's always a cost yeah. to well, that. Tell We'll send it to the seller and, and I'll give you the state statute. And you can tell them that it's state law and it's required for the seller to provide them. Yeah. Also, while we're talking about condos, it, it I think from a financing point of view, I think where's a good website? Because I think these condos, they have to be on a list, right? For banks to get approved. If they're going for FHA or VA approval, yes. If it's just a regular conventional, um, no, it, it depends on each lender. It depends on the lender's qualifications and it depends on the buyer's qualifications. Okay, so I was told that even includes conventional as well. So how do you, is that something the lender does or is that something that as an agent, you have to do the research to see if that condo is on the approved list? I don't, I don't believe you can do the, what, what, what Daryl is saying is, is I don't believe you can do the research a lender has to know because each of them have different mm -hmm. thresholds. Some of them, 55% of them have to be owner occupied or right. whatever the case is um, to feel good for them to feel good, quote unquote, about loaning the money on it. So lenders, lenders, Brian, I thought the uh, FHA, a, uh, I'm sorry, lenders have a, a condo questionnaire that they send out uh, usually that will cover the basis on that. Right, Mike. He's trying to he's trying to see if he can cut that process out so he doesn't even. Yeah, before this place. before even going into a deal, you want to find out. Hey, is this condo on the list? You know, you I don't you don't want to start a whole transaction to find out. Okay, uh, 
you know, this is not going to work because this condo is just not on the list of, of an approved lender. Like, I, so I, yeah, I, 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 I thought that, there was a link or website or something. I, I don't know that that's a thing, Jose, or, or, if, or if it's something that lenders have access to or they're, they're, they have guidelines from that particular place. But I have seen them immediately shoot down places and I've seen them tell, tell you, yes, that's, we can loan there. So okay. I don't know what kind of list they're using or whatever. And of course they have the questionnaire that they send out, but that should just verify, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know okay. if you guys have seen those, but um, next time you get a chance to look at one or ask a lender for their condo questionnaire. So you know what you're looking for, but um, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's experience or what it is, but sometimes a lender knows immediately that they can loan there. And sometimes they know they can't. Okay. So um, what, that'd be the first place to start. So just reach out to your lender and just, Give them the, the address and say, hey, is this on your approved, one of your approved? Uh, you know, Jose, that's a great question. I wish we had a lender in here. Uh, why don't you call your, your favorite lender and ask them if, they, if they've got a list? How do they, how do they determine it? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Do I can tell you what I've done. There is an 1-800 number called FHA Resource Center from the HUD that I, I have called before, and they have given me that information. But that's for FHA loans. Yes, if I I have called to find out if the condominiums qualify for an FHA loan. I have called that 800 number. You give them the address, you give them your email address, and they send you an email back. Right. So, so when I had a conversation with Alenda, some this is some time ago. Even with conventional loans, I think Ryan mentioned something. I think condominiums, by law, they have to have a certain percentage of reserve. Am I correct? Is something like that, Ryan? Yeah, I've seen them get sh shot down for not enough in reserves. Right. I've seen them get shot down for not enough uh, owner occupied. I've seen all kinds of stuff. They have right. And that's where that questionnaire comes in, right? That yes. they will have to fi fill out, and then based on that, um, well, they have to provide their they have to provide their bylaws and their um, and their financial statements. Mm -hmm. So their financials, the association does. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the part we we're talking about that is required by law. Mm -hmm. um, and it's required by contract. Awesome. Okay. Guys, I wanted to, oh, um, uh, in the chat, Jika, Malvis, you sent me some information about an appraiser the other day. Will you share that information with Jika? We share yes. it in the chat? Yes. Let me look his number. Jika wants to know about a good appraiser. You guys check that out. Malvis sent me um, a long email about an appraiser. Um, I didn't get all the way through it, but it was good. It was compelling. Sorry, I sent you a book to read. He's a good guy. <laughs> He's a good, yeah, yeah, I got that from the beginning. I checked out the beginning and the end and, and I didn't read the middle, but I'm sure it was good. Um, any other comments on condos, HOAs? Brian, there, is, there are two lists that were websites that were out there. HUD had theirs for the FHA loans and VA had theirs, which is very similar. And the, the complex had to be, uh, condo association complex had to be on the list to qualify for a loan. They discontinued that for a while. I don't know if it's come back, but in the meantime, after the crash, the lenders started with their questionnaire. So if it's on the HUD or the VA list, and I should be able to dig up those websites somewhere, uh, that'll tell you if they're, they qualify for FHA or VA. The condo questionnaires, almost every lender has come up with, and because I do a lot of investors uh, uh, going into these uh, not well-managed organizations is, is where the bargains are. And your, your down payments will, will, fall, will uh, change a bunch based on uh, the uh, owner oc versus uh, investment properties versus uh, litigation, all of that stuff. So there's kind of three ways to go at it, but your advice to check with the lender up front on what you're planning to do there. And then they'll send you a questionnaire, send that over to the management company and, and you'll, you'll be off and running. And there are still lists for FHA and VA. Actually, I just did it this morning. Um, just, okay. Google, just Google FHA approved condos Orlando or VA approved condos Orlando. And you'll go into the HUD website and it will show you. You can type in the county. You can type in what building it is. If that doesn't work, leave off the building and just go through all the Orange County or all whatever county that, that you're looking for. 
Um, I just did it this morning. Actually, I got a full price offer last night on a condo that I have a listing at. Um, got, I got all excited, of course. <laughs> and then she said, oh, by the way, it's a VA. I'm like, ah. It's not on the list? Like, no, it's not VA approved. And I, and I told her, I said, you know, this condo is not VA approved. And she goes, well, somebody told me it was. Mm. I said, well, you need to contact that somebody. Uh, maybe I'm wrong because maybe it's approved again. VA, FHA and VA, they can be approved um, the day before. So you have to constantly check. Um, I'm not sure if VA stays forever after it's approved. I did hear that once, but I'm not sure if that's true. Um, but they they come out of the approval process sometimes, and you have to have them reapproved. Um, to have the VA approved, I just found out that the application it takes about thirty to forty days to get VA approved, and it costs the lender or whoever's trying to. It's usually the lender. It costs eight hundred and fifty dollars for the application for the lender mm. to get it VA approved. Good luck with that. <laughs> what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, if if it's a local lender. Um, like I used to be a mortgage broker and so I used to broker a lot of, I used to finance a lot of condos locally. Um, and I wanted to get a lot of business from that one condo that I knew I would go ahead and spend the money to have it approved, even either FHA, VA, or both. That way I could advertise myself as a lender that I could do loans in that building. So usually if you check a local lender, they can tell you exactly what to do yeah. and help you out with the process. Good info. Brian, quick question on the commission disbursement authorization form. This is something that I, when, at the end of the year, who's the 1099 going to come from? Does the title company send it to you or does that come from Florida Realty Investment? Because I had an interesting situation two years ago with the CDA, that used to be from a previous uh, broker. And I called them up and I said, hey, I didn't get any 1099s from you. And they said, well, since you're using a CDA and they're doing the commission directly to you, that's supposed to come directly from the title company. And then the, when I called the co title company, they said, no, we don't send them out. Uh, title company is correct. They don't send them out. We record your CDAs. So we record your income from your CDAs, just like we, guys. So the money is, as you guys remember from, well, some of you will, and some of us have been around a long time, but you'll remember from your real estate class, agency law, the broker does all the business. You guys are independent contractors with the broker. So every money, all the money that you make out there, you make for Florida Realty Investments, okay? Because of our independent contract agreement with you that says that we give you 100%, you get, we owe you that money, right? So we disperse the money. That's why the, the commission disbursement authorization has to come from Florida Realty Investments and be signed by Carissa, our broker, okay? Because it's her money, the brokerage's money to distribute as we wish, right? Now we have a legal obligation to pay you guys because we have an agreement. So we send that in. And then this is, and some of you guys have been around a long time. This It's amazing that title companies even do this. I mean, it's so much, a lot of liability and stuff to take on and a lot of, fraud possibilities and stuff to take on, but they all want to kiss up to you guys and get you paid at the closing table. So you'll keep choosing them or you'll keep your sellers will keep choosing them. Right. So that's how the process works. So we're just, we are authorizing them, Jose, to distribute our, our commission, disperse our commission in the following way. So we'll do, you know, 175 or 350 for us and the rest to you or however you tell us to split it between you and Mike or, you know, you and Ida or whoever, right? So that's what we do. As long as we have all your paperwork in, we agree to disperse our commission. It saves us from having to write a check. It does open us up to headaches, but it's, you know, it's so instead of writing a check to you, you guys get, get, get your check directly from the title company and they mail us ours, okay? That's the idea. Pre-COVID and pre-lazy agents, we used to go to closing and get our check and it was awesome, right? All right. So at the end of the year, we're going to get a 1099. That's, that's um, our money, yeah. Jose. Right. They're just yeah. doing us the favor of writing yeah. you the check. It's a it's okay. a courtesy. Yeah. Right. So, but, but no, but we right. You're right. But we paid you. So Florida Realty Investments paid you that money, even though you might have directly gotten it from the title company. So it was Florida Realty Investments money to disperse. We get we show that as income, 
and then we show it as, as cost of goods sold, okay, when we pay you. So it's it's revenue to us, then it's money. It's money in, money out to us, and we just have the, the leftover transaction fee, okay, of however we got it. Does that make sense? So it is completely 100%, your only 1099 will come from us. In fact, I'm looking up our, our, um, our CDA right here, and the one that we send, in fact, most title companies make us have it on there, says, uh, ABC title company is not responsible for the tax ramifications for this agent and the broker would be responsible for providing a 1099. Mm -hmm. And I believe ours says that I'll have to look at any transaction. Um, but I believe ours says that not the one you fill out, but the one that we send to you and to the title company when you, uh, when you close. Okay. Thanks for uh, shedding light on that. You bet. So yeah, guys, if you have one that you've, that you've seen before and you should get copied on them when we send them to a title company. If you have one, check out the, the fine print on there and it should say Florida Realty Investments handles the 1099 tax ramifications for this agent or whatever. Some kind of language on there like that. Yes, Malvis, you had a question? Sorry, yeah, for Dalton actually. Um, um, you, Dalton, you mentioned that the buyers have three days to review documents and such or whatever. Is that something that needed to be included in the condo writer and an email in the contract? Um, or when they, on the third page of the condo writer, it says buyer request for documents. If they, if they check request, that means the seller has to provide it and they automatically have three days to review them. And what what documents are those? Are those the HOA bylaws for whichever HOA there is, or is there anything else additional to the bylaws? So, so when you're dealing with condos, it's a COA, the Condo Owners Association, and you would know the only time you would not request documents is if they're already included or you've already received them, or if you've In received the them three days prior to writing the contract because there's that option on there. But I put the state statute in the chat. And if you go read that, it'll, it's almost word for word what's in the condo rider. It'll show you like the four or five documents that you need. You need an FAQ, you need a end of year uh, financials. Um, there's a few other things in there. I think like the governance forms and stuff like that. Um, those are required. They have to provide those at their expense. And you have three days to review those. So. I've had somebody not send them to me until 20 days into the contract. 20 days into the contract? Yeah, I've used it to get out of a contract. <clears throat> We've already passed our inspection period and the the end they sent me the documents and my set or my buyer said uh, the end of year financials didn't look good to him. They didn't have enough reserves, so he canceled the contract. So we got our escrow back and canceled. And was that, there that, anything, was there that anything in your I'm sorry. No, that happens a lot of times with lenders. I'm going to go ahead and go. This happens a lot of times with lenders. And I hear from you guys a lot that the lender uh, wouldn't do it because they didn't have enough reserves or whatever. It blows up the deal in that regard. And then I've heard a lot of you guys, buyers, uh, even cash deals get nervous because of uh, litigation, which is a whole nother subject that we can talk about and we have before. But uh, go ahead, Thomas. Uh, is that for that, is there anything that needs to check that needed to be checked on the rider to get the yeah, the, con yeah, the condo rider, I think it's the second page, says that buyer has the right for three days to review these documents. There's two big sections and they're like all in bold. The other one says that the buyer has already received them three days in advance. So that should be your two options. And when you're filling out the writer where it says request HOA documents, it's very important to do that, to actually request them. Okay, I, I want a huge case that we had to take to court, and I want a huge escrow because another agent didn't request the condo docs from me. That was my that was my total thing that I that I won the case from because I told my attorney he never requested the docs. Because he was telling me, his, his attorney was telling me, he never got the docs. I said he never requested them. The judge looked at me and said, you won. You won. And it, it was a huge win. There, there, there are two boxes in there. One that says the buyer, the, on page two, um, 
It says non-developer disclosure, non-developer disclosure. Uh, there are ones that said the buyer acknowledged the buyer has been provided current copy of the declaration of condominium articles of incorporation of the association by laws, rules and association, blah, 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 blah. The other one, um, and uh, frequently asked questions and answered document more than three days, excluding Saturday. And the other one says agreement is voidable by buyer by delivering a written notice of buyer intention to cancel within three days, excluding Saturdays and Sunday, blah, 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 after execution. Is any of those two needed to be checked? Needs to be checked? When you request documents or by requesting documents on the first box, um, they already are to send it to you. I don't see where you're at. Uh, I think on she's on number three. six on page three, buyer's request for documents. Okay. Is that what you're, is that what you're asking? You just check the box that says requests. Yeah, yes. just check requests. Just check requests. So in yeah. the, any of the other two boxes on the second page doesn't need to be checked as long as you check on request on the third No, page. no. So under non-developer disclosure. So I'm not an attorney, but if you go yes. read the state statutes, there is, there's, it's broken up into two sections. You have developers and non-developers. So these are obviously specific to resale because developers have a different, different uh, set of disclosures. So under non-developer, you have three days. So if you receive the documents three days prior to writing the contract, you would check the A box. If you receive, if you haven't received the documents, then you would check the B box, which says you have three days to review them. And then down in section six, you would put that you request the documents. That way it's telling the seller you're requesting the documents. And then upon receipt of the documents, you have three days to review them. Okay, so in other words, page three, line six, box request goes along with page two, uh, paragraph five, second box. Yep. Correct, because you wouldn't be requesting documents if you've already received them three days prior to writing the contract. Okay. But you also could receive them the day of contract and you wouldn't need to request them because you've already got them. So. You, it's just by every situation. I would still click request there, um, just in case, even if you get them that day, even if they're an attachment on the HO, on the MLS. Um, guys, you, uh, you are, because there's probably not everything going to be on there, but hopefully when we talk about these things, what to do from a buyer's perspective, you guys are also in your mind turning it around to what you should do as a listing agent of these things as well, what you should provide and what you go, need to go ahead and have on hand um, Daryl, with your case, I'm sure you, there were things you would do differently to stay out of court, um, to start with, um, and congrats on your big win. Um, but, uh, but there are things that you would do differently to stay out of court, stay out of conflict and to, to make things go more smoothly and go ahead and sell the thing, right. And not have to collect your commission instead of going to court. So there are things that we would do differently. And guys, hopefully when you, you look at the inverse of what we're talking about, when you come at it from the other side, like when we talk about the the financing contingency we always talk about on the on the as is what to do from the seller side to make things go more smoothly and to make sure your client doesn't get their property tied up so as i'm teaching you how to make sure you get your deposit back for your buyer if things don't work out i also hope mm -hmm. that you're learning how to keep this from happening to your seller and uh keep the keep the deal moving so think about that um guys i have uh uh, we can keep going here. I just wanted to remark that we had a, a tremendous turnout for you guys getting the getting the invite six minutes before it started. And I think that uh, we might start doing that more often. And having no training portion whatsoever got just as many people as when we do have one. So that works out well, too. So I appreciate that. Appreciate you guys coming last minute. Uh, let's keep going, though. Whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, I'm done with uh, the only thing I got was was that one email. So anything else you guys want to talk about? I just want to ask you. So, if if I if I come across a client, which is possibly with a, as far as uh, property rental, you know, handling their 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 property, you know, renting it out, and uh, is that something we refer to a division? Is that something I can do? What what's the best way to go about that? You recommend? Uh, I recommend that unless you've got fifty of them, you don't get into property management. Okay. 
Um, it is a lot of headache for a little bit of money, unless it's an economy of scale thing. If you've got a bunch of them, then it's worth doing. If you don't, I think anybody, if you guys have ever managed even your own properties, realize what a pain it is. And now imagine doing it for, for 40 bucks a month. Um, so it's something to think about there. If you, um, we pay a fee, our property management side does, and I don't, I don't, I know as much about that as they do about this side, not, not much, uh, but they pay a fee for uh, a referral. Um, they keep you on as the liaison if the person ever wants to sell that unit. And um, those of you who have referred properties to us before know you, you get 250 bucks per, per door per property. Um, and um, then you get your, the liaison if, you have, if they ever want to sell it or whatever they want to do, okay. you're still their person. Well, they'll manage um, it. They'll, they'll, they'll find somebody to rent it out. They'll, you oh, know, yeah, they'll yeah. professionally yeah, so manage it, you know, check them out, background, all that stuff. And uh, they'll, so just trying to keep, keep, the uh the business in our pipeline with the company sure yeah yeah we manage um somewhere between 1500 yeah. and 2000 properties yeah so yeah they're they they've got 33 employees or yeah. something like I, that. i'm just bringing it up because so, uh last house i just sold on they mentioned they say hey i might want to rent this out is that something you can help me out with so i want to be able to say yeah we can do that for you my my brokerage uh has a division that would take care of that for you yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and type down here our uh, mm -hmm. our uh, website. Now, a lot of you guys checked out our Join FRI one when you started here. That's our real our our agent website, but this is our uh, main company website. I just put in there. Yeah, we're we are uh, a huge property management company. And also for how about commercial leasing? That is up to the agent. We have lots of agents who do it. Yeah. That is up to the individual agents to do. Um, but yes, we do that as well. And, is there and, someone and like if I if well. I need assistance can can like kind of help me along with that? Uh, who who yes, would sir. be a go to? So I'll just reach out to you, Ryan, in case yes. say, hey, I, I got somebody that's looking for some commercial space. Yes. Uh, you know, just to know the ins and out. Um okay. So I'll, maybe... I'll talk to you guys a little bit about this. And, and, and I do every time we talk about commercial, what I always recommend to you guys, if you don't have a lot of commercial experience, refer your first deal of any kind of type. And, and, and guys, commercial is not commercial. Commercial has so many niches, 10 or 12 niches that, you know, uh, an industrial uh, sales guy doesn't know anything about land uh, or doesn't know much about land. A land guy doesn't know anything about office space downtown. You know, there's all different kinds of niches where um, it's, it's very, um, each one is very individual. So when you get a, a, a deal for somebody wants to lease a, a 500,000 square feet of industrial space, go ahead and refer that to somebody. And if you want to stay in the deal, stay in the deal. And people will do, you know, commercial referrals aren't exactly like residential ones. If you want to stay in the deal and do the legwork and do all that kind of stuff, you can probably get a little bit better split, especially on a, on a huge deal. You get a better split. You can probably split the deal with them and tell them you want to work the deal with them. Part of my, part of the condition of this referral is I'm going to work the deal with you. I'm going to go to the meetings. I'm going to, I'm going to do your legwork. I'm going to be involved in this. I'm going to learn the process. Do that kind of stuff. If you want to get, you don't just, uh, you will get crushed out there in the commercial world if you go into, and guys, I have 15 years of commercial, but mostly in land and, and uh, leasing. If you, if I try to step into an industrial setting with some of these industrial guys, they'll eat my lunch because I don't, I don't know it, right? So even within the commercial world, if I were to get an industrial lead on someone, I would, I would, share that I would refer that to an industrial guy and then if I wanted to learn about industrial I'd get involved yeah and I only ask because I I got a potential client that might be coming down from Texas he's a police officer I've been keeping him in my pipeline for about a year and a half and he's recently sold his house out there in Texas and uh he bought into I think Metro Flex, Metro Flex some kind of gym franchise Mm -hmm. So he's looking for, he's going to be needing probably some commercials leasing space for about something like anywhere from 35 to 5,000 square foot. Uh, I just want to be able to, to just professionally let them know, hey, don't worry, we can assist you with that. 
whether it be me or my agency, we'll, we'll take care of that. Absolutely. Jose, we, we cover everything, man. This okay. brokerage covers everything. So okay. yes. And the answer for you guys, if you guys are salespeople, the answer is always, yeah, we can help you with that. Right. Even awesome. if we refer it within our brokerage or even outside of the brokerage, we can help you with that. You're going to be the liaison, even if you, especially on these commercial deals, even if you refer it outside of our brokerage, you're still going to be the liaison for the guy. Yeah. Right. Awesome. So Good. yes, we absolutely can. But yet we have, um, we probably have 40 agents out there doing commercial stuff. So awesome. um, most of them don't come into these meetings, but some do. And uh, I see AJ is here. AJ's one, Vivian does. Um, and I don't mean to leave anybody out. I can't even see everybody on my screen. So don't get mad. Um, <laughs> people I can see on my screen right now. But yes, um, if you need help with, with commercial stuff, um, I have a background in it and these people do as well. But I mean, I'm not going to work to deal with you, but, but they will. Okay, All right. awesome. Um, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Brian, um, we just had the uh, board uh, elections. I didn't see anything come out uh, about if we had a position on any directors uh, or any of the officers. Uh, that is on my list of things to talk about today. We have, okay. um, we have, if you guys are on Aura, we have uh, board elections coming up. We have our very own Christina Rordham running. Please support Ms. Rordham. She is, uh, she's actually led a class on here before. I don't know if you guys remember about a year ago, um, she did a class for us on here. Um, she's a great and involved young lady and she will do a great job on there. So please support her, um, go online. I will get you, I'll let you send out an email. Um, showing you how to vote and, and stuff. So those of you who are on the Orlando Regional Realtor Association. So yes, thank you. And Ida wanted me to share that too. Thank you, Ida. Uh, the second question, uh, our PAC, uh, our, our Florida Realtors, was going to support a constitutional amendment to fully fund the Sadowski Fund, and then they backed down from Sproul's. If, I haven't seen any reason why we got out of that so quickly. Uh, any, any insight on that or any, anybody know where to go? Who's our RPAC representative? I, I don't know anything about that. Okay. Um, okay, well, that's, that was really weird. We put $3 million into it as an association and then backed away from it. Um, and I thought, hey, we could put $13 million because NAR put $10 million in it uh, to back the amendment. So that was really weird that we backed away and I've seen no explanation of why we spent that money and then didn't, didn't follow through. Um, if you don't mind following up on that, letting us know and educating us on it, I, I would love to, to hear that because I don't know anything about it. Okay. Uh, the same day, I got a letter from RPAC thanking me for my uh, contribution. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait a minute here. I'm thinking, rethink that one. Uh, the 40, you know, this is probably going to go into commercial, but I've got somebody looking. Um, any update on the Champlain Towers? I've not seen anything official on what that 40 year rule is going to be. The, 40 year inspections. Um, I've got some out of state investors that are looking to do 50 to 300 doors and they want information. And I have only seen newspaper articles about what's going to happen. But do we, do we know if there's anything official from Florida Realtors or anything that's happened as a result of that collapse as far as building codes, building rules? I haven't seen anything. Okay. I've been looking, I can't find anything. An investor is looking for that. And I'm also wondering if people that we're talking about special assessments, if they're going to, uh, one of the reasons they didn't fix that place was the special assessments was running into the many millions of dollars. It was gonna be like several hundred thousand dollars per unit. Um, and so they knew they had a problem and they didn't fix it. Um, but there's been also talk about new legislation, new stuff, and I have not seen any, I can't find anything 
uh, concrete on that. Just a lot of newspaper articles and some politicians saying we, we ought to have a new law, but I haven't seen anything concrete. I did hear that they increased the inspections over on the coast, over on what, Flag Flagler County, Volusia, um, all, all the coast counties over there. Um, I'm pretty sure it's true. I can't remember who I heard it from or where I saw it, but I did hear that they definitely increased the inspections. I was I would expect inspections to get much more diligent. And you know, the thud factor, I you know, if it's a 50-page inspection now, it's going to be a 200 page inspection just to, as a CYA for the inspector. Um, and then I think the associations and owners are going to probably if they get a unit that's approaching that 40 year mark are, are going to not want to do the investment it's going to take to fix, which is on the flip side of that is a potential investment opportunity. So it's trying to get as much information as I can, but I've not been able to dig anything out that's concrete. A lot of speculation in newspapers and, you know, there's, you know, how do we ever let this happen kind of thing. But even the task force, the building department said, you can't recommend changes to the building code because you don't know that's what caused uh, the unit to collapse was a, you know, poor inspections or poor building codes. So they, they've kind of come down and said, so this blue ribbon task force that the mayor of the, of the Surfside put together basically came out and the building inspector who was part of that said, you can recommend that we do a better job, but we they haven't even finished the investigation as to why it actually collapsed. So he's like, that's it's a, it's a bogus recommendation, and that's the only thing I've seen come out is that task force, and it was a non-binding, uh, you know, rule. So, and I've heard that there's going to be legislation uh, put in to put some more teeth into that, but I'm I've not seen anything. I can't find anything. So there's those are kind of, go ahead. The problem with that specific building and others like it is the preponderance of time that passes with issues not being addressed. A $10,000 assessment in 2000 is up in the tens of hundreds of thousands today for the same work. So all things being equal, every property will still be under a signal. I think they call it a signal, single assessment protocol. So they're not going to do a blanket law. I've already been told that by two people. There's not going to be blanket legislation. There's going to be individual buildings of a certain age are going to be assessed individually. Does that make sense? But that's what they're currently doing, Vivian, is uh, they just they don't apparently do it well. Right. Right. And so what they're saying is that they're going to beef up that before the, see what you're talking about is your guy wants to build 300 doors. Well, he can build 300 doors because he's building it according to 2022 code. He doesn't no, he's wanting to, to he's, he's wanting to buy up to 300 doors. He wants to buy existing doors. Okay. That's yeah. different. Sorry. I thought you said he wanted to build. Okay. Well, I mean, it's going to be up to the insurers, probably. They're the ones that have the biggest stake in the game, and they're the ones that are going to make the decision, not the construction industry. Correct, Brian? Yes. Let me. Let me. Um, yes. Um, let's move. Let's move on. I've got to answer another question here. Um, uh, Lisa wants to set up an LLC or a PA. Is it best to use your name? Uh, you have to use your name. So we can only pay your name. You can be Lisa Sager LLC, Lisa Sager PA, Lisa Sager PLLC, whatever um, your accountant tells you is the best for your tax purposes. But it has to be, you can't be, you know, happy sunshine uh, LLC because we can't pay that. I mean, you can open LLC if you want to, but we can't pay that. We can only, so the, the, the state won't make your license name that for obvious reasons so people can, can verify your license. You have to be Lisa, Lisa Sager, whatever letters you want to use, whatever letter your accountant tells you is best for your tax situation. Um, you can't use a different name. So that's what you'll do. Would you set it up as only your name and add LLC? Yes. Yes. So make sure you do it right on some bits. 
because we've had some of you guys set up LLCs before, you know, happy sunshine LLC. And I've had to tell you, we can't, sorry, we can't pay that. Um, you can only pay your, we can only pay whatever your license name is. Okay. Um, quick reminder of who a brokerage can pay. So when you guys request referrals and stuff be paid to people, we can pay you guys are independent contractors who are legally signed up with us in the state with the state BBPR, we can pay other brokerages and we can pay any party to that transaction. Okay. So your buyer or seller, whatever we can, we can disperse money to any of those people. We cannot pay it to Susie Smith with Keller Williams. We have to pay Keller Williams. They have to pay Susie Smith. Okay. Um, just so you guys, we have all kinds of requests for us to pay people and we can't pay your lawn guy for, for sending his brother to you and you can't pay him either. Okay. Unless he's a licensed agent signed up under a brokerage. All right. So yeah. So Lisa, to answer your question, you'll want to be Lisa Sager, whatever, LLC, PA, ask your accountant what's best for you. I don't know if I mentioned that I, am not a lawyer or an accountant. I like to say that every meeting. Full disclosure. Uh, full disclosure. Yes. Um, all right. Any other questions or comments? I'm good. Thank you. Romina. Yes. Uh, yes. Good morning. morning. Uh, I have a question. As a listing agent, if somebody um, sends you an offer and the contract says 45 days to close, um, is the approval period, the, the loan approval period still 30 days? It's whatever's in that box. If it's empty, it's 30 days. If they put in a different number, then it's a different number. So okay. I don't have it sitting in front of me, but if there's a, there's a thing there that says the loan approval period will be blank if left blank 30 days. It was blank. So it's 30 days on that case. It's case 30 days. Yeah. So, well, I don't know, but why somebody will ask for 45 days if... It, an inspection to close? Days, yes, to close. What do you think it could be? Um, well, they don't know when the, the deal is going to get signed. So it's kind of being lazy. I like to I like to do 47 days or something, assuming the deal will be signed in a couple of days if it's going to be accepted. Um, but some people, that's kind of an old school thing. There used to be a thing where you close within 45 days, within 60 days of acceptance. Yeah. The, the date wasn't actually always on the contract. So that used to be a thing. Um, so it might be an old school agent, or it might just be someone who's tired of people dragging their deals out a week, and they give them a closing in 45 days, and now it's 35 days before they get the deal signed. So they like to make it a fluid date. I like to make it a concrete date. Yeah. And oh, say, you could say on or before, right? You can say on or before, yeah, but, but they want to give themselves plenty of time. So I don't right. want to put, I don't want to put today's the 22nd. I don't want to put October 31st, and then you don't take the deal till, till October 2nd. And now I've got 29 days to close. So oh. that's why they might put 45 days on there. Happens a lot with commercial deals, which get reviewed by lawyers and stuff like that. So they like to put- What do you mean when you take the deal? You mean when the seller signs? Right. So if I, I call it a floating that's date, the if, I say, starts, if right? I say rather than October, October 31st, I'm just doing this because I can do the math. I say rather than 39 days, that we'll have 39 days to close, I would say October 31st. But on a commercial deal or on a deal where, you, where you're telling me you're not going to decide until next week, you know, we'll take offers all weekend and we'll tell you on Tuesday what happens. Then I might make it a floating date because I don't know when you're going to decide. And I don't want to put something too far out there. I want to give my people plenty of time to close, but I also don't want to put something so far out there that my offer is not as attractive. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to put November, you know, I don't want to make it 50 days and put November 10th, November 12th, and then have Daryl come in and put, you know, November 5th and you guys like his deal better, even though we could have closed in too. So they'll probably put that. that I, I'm not sure why people would do that. I mean, other than, I mean, there's reasons why they would do it, but it's just an either or really. Um, and I don't like it. I like concrete dates on contracts. Well, I, yeah, I just, I, I read the whole contract from the top to the bottom to see where the, you know, little things could probably be. Uh, but the other uh, question is, you know, when um, they send you an offer and it says uh, no appraisal contingency on the terms, is that enough to- On the terms, it says no appraisal contingency? Yes. On additional terms, additional notes on page 11? Yes. 
yeah, that's, 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 well, I'd like to see it, but that should say, no, not if they just say there's no appraisal contingency attached, because there is an appraisal contingency in these as is, as we talked about on here, and I know you've been yeah, on here, we talked okay. about it. On the top. Uh, I, I don't, I'd rather, I'd rather see something not too legalistic, but, but more specific than that. Like, like. I don't want to see the words just no appraisal contingency because that could be that could be interpreted as though there's not an appraisal contingency form accompanying this contract. I don't I just don't like it. I okay. think it would probably hold up, but I don't like it. So uh, let me because 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 when I say the words appraisal contingency, everybody's head goes right to that little form that attaches. Right. You guys yeah. think about the writer. If I say, hey, look at that appraisal contingency. You guys would think about the writer that comes with the contract that says appraisal contingency, right? So I don't like just no appraisal contingency. Uh, I don't know. Let me let me uh, tell you exactly what it says. It says this agreement is not contingent upon an appraisal. Okay, that's better. That's good. This agreement is not what contingent mm -hmm. upon an appraisal. What was the word after contingent? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's my my Spanglish right there. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me hold on. Let me open it again. Uh, we we we. Okay, it says um, this agreement is not contingent, and the word is U P O N. I thought that's what it was. Upon. Yeah. Upon. Oh, okay. Upon an appraisal. Okay, I thought that's what it was. Okay. Um, that's not good. This this agreement is not contingent upon an appraisal. Yeah. Um, I don't. It's, it's very it's very vague. Yeah, I don't. Waving I don't your, like it you're either. waving you're waving the contingent the appraisal contingency clause for your buyer. No, no, she's a seller. Oh, so. well, she's a seller. Ryan, I put some oh. language that I've been requesting for offers on my on my contracts in there that we've been using for the additional terms, and it spells it out a little bit more clearly for the buyer and seller to understand. I mean, if you like it. All right. So, okay. so let me understand this. So, she's representing the seller, and she's putting that in the contract, and she's basically what she's basically saying. Uh, she wants the buyer to waive the con appraisal contingency clause. So that this way, that's not a, a protection that he's gonna have available to him. Correct. She's she's on the listing side. She received a contract that says. In the additional terms that the contract right. is not a, uh, contingent upon an appraisal. Right. Now, um, if I was so, a buyer, if I had a buyer, and I would never have my client. Well, if you you would if you want to buy this house now. So, oh, well, in the event, yeah. so no, I read. think he's mis he's misunderstanding. He's thinking she's requiring that for that deal, but it's not. That it's a, buyer the submitted the offer, yeah. waiving the appraisal. Right. So I am pointing at my screen. You guys can't see here, but in the event, uh, so uh, um, Angie submitted this in the in the chat um, appraisal waiver language. Guys, I sent this out to you guys before, and it's almost exactly this, at least the first part, which I think is all that's necessary. In the event the appraised value of the property is less than the purchase price, buyer agrees to pay the difference between appraised value and the purchase price. Buyer acknowledges that's where that's I think that's enough. But uh, she goes a little bit further. Buyer acknowledges this amount constitutes additional funds. If you're on the buyer side, then yes, I would have this. I would have this as protecting you on the buyer side. But from the seller side, all I need to see is that first part. So the only time I've done this is from the seller side to counter an offer and then write this into the additional term. Right. So, but if you're on the buyer side and you're doing this, that's when you write as an agent, you want the buyer to acknowledge this. I like this part for that reason. Seller side, all I need to see is this part. I'm going to tell you, here it is. I'm going to recap it from the seller side. All I care to see is in the event, the appraised value of the property is less than the purchase price. Buyer agrees to pay the difference between appraised value and the purchase price. I'm done as a seller. That's good enough. As a buyer's agent, you're protecting yourself when you say, my stupid buyer acknowledges that this amount constitutes additional funds that must be paid by buyer at closing, either as part of the buyer's principal loan amount, or if not including the principal of the loan, then as part of the buyer's obligation, provide cash and other funds at closing. So Mr. Buyer, don't come back on me because you didn't understand that if this thing falls short, you're gonna have to come out with another $25,000 or $10,000 or $4,000 or whatever the amount is, okay? Isn't that language already in the contract? No, sir, it's not. 
Now nope. there's appraisal contingency. I'm so if the house there's an appraisal contingency in the contract. Right. So we went over, yeah, we did this last couple of meetings. There's appraisal contingency a couple of meetings ago. There's appraisal contingency in the contract line 116 to 125 around there somewhere. I don't remember the exact numbers. Right. If, but it says if the appraisal comes back and it's not, I don't care even if it's after the loan approval date, the appraisal comes back uh short or something that does not fit the lender's uh pre-approval then you are uh, out you can get out of the deal and get your money back that's right the exactly that's the protection period for the buyer right, but they're getting but they're getting this is getting rid of that so the, so um i think this is buyer agrees and acknowledges this provision shall constitute a waiver and removal buyers and boy you angie's covering her bases here with her buyer i like it buyer agrees and acknowledges this provision shall constitute a waiver and removal of buyer's contingency and right to terminate the contract in the event the termination of value of the property for the property obtained by buyer's lender is insufficient in terms of loan approval as set forth in paragraph eight of the contract okay great that is great stuff for a buyer side for the seller side all i care is that first part the rest of this doesn't apply to the seller it's the it's the buyer's agent covering their butt all well, right the, that's first part in the event the appraised value right yep all i care to see is that, that, that they're going to make up the difference they understand that they do not have an appraisal contingency because they agreed to make up the difference between appraisal and uh, purchase price, contract price. So in this case, that is already written in the, the way I told you. Should I change it or send a something? I would send, I would send this first sentence. Don't yeah. get involved in their buyer's business. Don't get involved in anything. You don't write anything that the buyer understands this and that. That's not your client. Don't worry but, about that. Put the... Uh, but that first sentence, you can't see where my cursor is. But in the event the appraised value of the property is less than the purchase price, buyer agrees to pay the difference between appraised value and the purchase price. Uh -huh. I see, see that in chat. Okay. That from, from, from Angie, but how should I send that now that the contract is being the contract contract has been uh, accepted? Oh, it's already been accepted. You can't. Because I was trying to, yeah, I call I wouldn't you. let you change anything on there if I'm the other side. So I've, I've, I've included this in my MLS documents too, um, as requests from the seller. You know, he's requesting that if you are waiving the appraisal to use this language, um, or if you're limiting the appraisal to use this language, just so that it's clear. Um, and I do on the seller side, I request it all spelled out because I, I agree with you, Ryan, it's not necessary, but I think it makes it very clear to that buyer that they're acknowledging that. Um, cause a lot of times I think buyers can get swept up in this market right now and not really realize what they're agreeing to. So I think this spells it out and hopefully they read it before they sign it. Yeah, but I don't want, but I, that's great. And, and if you said that, that would be fine, but I don't want her writing that. As a, as a counter, I, as a, I, I don't want her writing that as the counter. I, I, I just don't, I, I, that's, that's me. I would never let my client signs a bunch of stuff that says that's written by the other side that says buyers, just like, I don't let my client sign somebody else's um which i've had requested of me to sign their affiliated business disclosure on yeah. the other side i don't i'm not my my client's not signing any of your documents mm -hmm. i don't want you writing stuff for my client we'll stick with what's on their agreement but that's me angie if if other people if you want to write it for people and they agree to sign it that's good mm -hmm. just remember the the burden the the burden uh legally the burden i'm not a lawyer again but legally the burden is on the person who writes the language and if you go outside of what you do and you write language, the, 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 what is it? The favor of the law always goes to the person who did not write it. Okay. Um, if you understand, if there's any kind of misunderstanding, I don't know if you guys know that principle, uh, Dalton, Dalton could have answered this if he was here because he's in law school. Uh, but I'm sure he knows the, the actual principle that is the, the, and it said the tie goes to the runner. The tie goes to the guy who didn't write the, the language to the, typically it goes to the consumer first and then it goes to the consumer who did not write the language so okay. so ryan let me ask you a quick question so as you know this market's crazy right everything's going 15 20 30 000 above list price so if someone is listing a home let's say four hundred thousand, and somebody offers 450 right in the contract that house needs to come in at 450 or is it based on the list price that the seller had 
Okay. Um, well, what does okay. that have to appraise on the list? You, right? Jose, you're going to get me into my uh, appraisal speech. Oh, I'm sorry. Speech, don't don't, I don't, like, don't want to go. Don't go down a rabbit hole. Don't worry. About I don't want to go into an appraisal speech. Um, no. But because I I hate them. So okay. I mean, just hate the concept of a house being worth <laughs> what it's appraised for. A house is worth what someone agrees to sell it for. Okay, or what someone agrees to buy it for. Someone ready, willing, and able would buy that. I'm not going to go into my analogies okay. and other stuff that I do because I do go off on a tangent. So, but I will tell you this: <laughs> if it's contracted at 450, so what she's talking about here is the contracted purchase price. The only difference between her first sentence that she said there and the language that we gave you is, is, is I put contracted purchase price. Um, she has purchase price, which is fine. So the contracted purchase price is 450 on the property you're talking about. I don't care what the appraisal is. If they have this language, they've got to come up with the rest of the cash. If it appraises at 380. They got to come up with the rest of the cash. If it appraises for 450, awesome, then no problem. If right. it appraises for 420, they've got to come up with the rest of the cash. Appraise at 400, they've got to come up whatever it is. They've got to come up. If it appraises for a hundred dollars, they've got to come up with 449,900 dollars cash for closing. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that's how it it works. Yeah, regardless whatever of what they had it, regardless of what they had it listed, the purchase the appraisal price is simply. Office. The appraisal is simply something that the lender says, we'll loan you 95, 80, whatever percent of this amount, whatever we think it's worth. We'll loan the you value, yeah. X amount of what we think it's worth. If they only think it's worth 400 and they're loaning them 90%, then they'll loan them 360 and the buyer's going to have to come up with $90,000 plus closing costs to close. Okay? That's cool. So at this point, uh, Ryan, of yes. course, I believe in the way it is, but let's say now the appraisal comes back lower and they wanted to get out of the contract based on what he already you know, put on the terms. Is it enough with those things? I, I, I think with the terms they put on there, it's fine. It's fine. I, I think you're fine. I don't like it, but I think you're fine. They, they said that there's no, uh, it doesn't, it's not contingent upon the uh, appraisal. So that's good enough, but it's not the perfect way. Next time I will do it the way Angie. Right, yes, terms. yes. Okay. And we gave language to you guys for this. Um, we put it on Facebook, and I believe we have it on um, Paper Plus Pipeline. Um, I didn't see it. On, yeah, I didn't see it on. There is. Paper Plus Pipeline. I don't know. We'll find it on there. But but I already screenshot that one, so I'll keep it for my notes for next time. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, any other questions? I'm pretty sure it was on here. I have a question, sorry. Um, question uh, the, is, if the, either of the language from either side is, is not written on the offer, um, let's say the buyer, uh, the appraiser came out higher, but none of the language was written. They still can, written or not, they still can get out of the contract, correct? Once it's accepted? Um, they still written or not what? They, they can't. They, if, if okay. The appraise, okay, if the appraised value was higher and um, they still can get out of the contract, right? The appraised value is higher than the contracted purchase price? The purchase price, correct. Uh, the appraise, so it appraised, so let's say it sold for 400, but the appraisal came back at 415. Correct. They still can get out, right? No, they can't get out for that. No, no there's nothing wrong with the appraisal. Yeah, they can't. No, there, there's no. I mean, that that satisfied the contingency. It appraised for plenty. Oh, okay. it's, a, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing. Now, the the, the bank is obviously going to base their loan on contract price. In that case, they're going to base it on the lower of contract price or appraisal. Um, Romina, are you waving your arms again? You raised your hand? Okay, no. Okay. Um, anybody Anybody else, any other questions or comments? I have a quick one, Ryan. Yes. If, um, if anyone's ever done a listing for a, I have a seller that owns a piece of vacant land and we want to list a, a house on it as pre-construction, um, I have a builder who's given me plans and a price um, and has agreed to pay commission and the sellers agreed to pay commission on their portion. Um, if anybody's done that type of listing before where it's really just a vacant land, but it's a new construction single build um, from a custom builder, um, I have some questions 
on that. If you know anybody can help me out. I have not personally seen any of our agents do that. Um, I've seen listings like that, which are great. I've seen them sell. I've almost bought one like that, but I have not. Uh, I have not seen any of our agents actually that I know of actually. Do I've, that. I've done it a couple times. I'm not sure how many questions I can ask about it because I'm not that. I'm not an expert in it yet. I can try though. Yeah, that's fine. I'll send you an email then, Daryl. See if you. Okay, can cool. Add it okay. On. Thanks, Andy. Any other questions or comments? Um, all right, so guys, don't forget, please, if you're in the Orlando Regional Realtor Association, get on there and vote for Christina Rordham. Um, I don't wanna tell you how to vote, but do, uh, you know, but vote for Christina if you're gonna vote. Um, and- uh, Everybody should have received an email from Aura uh, this earlier this week, I think maybe Monday. Yeah. I'm, I'm in Tampa, so. Okay. What's her last name? What is her last name? Rordam, R-O-R-D-A-M. How about if I write it in here, Christina Rordam. In Tampa, isn't Judson Von Warp on our, in our brokerage too? Is he running for something? Yeah, he's on there for um, Tampa. So if you're in Tampa, you can vote for him. Um, you can vote for him if you want. He's not with our brokerage anymore. He's not? Oh, okay. he's, not he's a nice guy, he's a good guy. Okay. Um, but Christina is on there. Uh, I just put her name in the, in the chat. Uh, so get on there and vote for her if you can. And uh, otherwise, we riot. All right. Um, so it closes on Friday at five o'clock. That's the last time you can vote. Okay. Friday by five o'clock. Yes. And Christina is a very uh, nice young lady and very smart, and she's very involved at Aura as well. Yes, she is. And and she can see who voted and who didn't. So. Um, oh. There I'm just kidding. Oh. She can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So, uh, all right, guys, go out there and go get them. Right. And at that one o'clock, guys, go grab some lunch or whatever and do that thing at one o'clock. Someone had asked what it's about. You guys um, saw Mr. Habib before. Is that right? What is that one o'clock? I'm sorry. I missed that. Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is. You got my, you got my, uh, my, 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 uh, uh, Message yesterday, right, about tomorrow's open forum? No. Barry Habib, he is awesome. He, you guys remember him before? He does, uh, I the part I didn't, I didn't copy on here what he does, but or what he's talking about today, but it's about taking your business to the next level. He's a very good guy at, at growing your business. Uh, okay. Very sharp guy. He's got four, these are, there are four of these, it's a series. Um, check them all out. You register on the link that I sent you yesterday. I, need, Go ahead I didn't and get anything. Yeah, I didn't get that. Well, uh, um, yes. Checking my email, email now. It's an email from Ryan from yesterday about Barry Habib, and he's the CEO of MBS Highway, most highly regarded, recognized tool for transforming salespeople into advisors. Yeah, if you could resend that. That'd be great. I don't. I don't I'm know. I'm sending it to you two right now. Anybody else not get it? Anybody else Thank have you. me on on block? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I block you, but um, I'm just double checking. I might have missed your message yesterday. I'll, I'll recheck it. No problem. Uh, All right. I, I just sent it. I just resent it to uh, Carolina and Jose. Anyone else? Thank, thank you so much. All right, guys. We'll go grab some lunch or something. That starts okay. at one o'clock. Um, I didn't want to keep you on even this long. This went longer than a, than a normal one, but I appreciate you guys. Uh, participating and you guys were great um go get them kids oh, one o'clock is that thing and then we'll see you next wednesday at 10 30 um that he has got a weird schedule with that so one o'clock today and then one o'clock next tuesday uh, i'll be doing regular open forums from here on out and we'll have a training discussion next week maybe on commercial leasing maybe on something else exciting you guys come up with and email me about during this week you change my mind. tuesday or wednesday you said you just I'm doing, said I'm doing wednesday 10 30 always wednesday 10 30 right unless, right unless okay. otherwise notified but he's going to be on again next tuesday at one o'clock got it I, I shouldn't even talk about him wednesday at 10 30 i don't want to confuse anybody All see right. you guys here thanks thanks All right, guys bye everybody